everybody. Um, welcome to today's um, University Center virtual seminar on strategies for designing, creating, and renovating your business model. Um, this will be presented by Susan Cornelius. Hi, everybody. Um, and it's going to be a semi um, interactive virtual seminar. So if you have questions, just put them in the chat and I'll be monitoring those and um, Susan will answer them um, as any questions come up, feel free to ask them. So without further ado, um, I'll let Susan get started here. Okay, everybody, good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I, I actually have to get to the beginning of my presentation, so you're getting the speed version of it. That was not a good idea, Susan. Okay, there we go. Hi, everybody. My name is Susan Rosenbaum Cornelius. I really feel privileged to be talking with you today. What we're going to do with the program, because normally these things are very, very interactive, is you know where the chat function is on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, Cecilia is going to be helping me to monitor this. When you have a question or a comment that you would like to make, if it's a question, just ask it on chat and I'll do my best with Cecilia's help to answer it. If you'd like to make a comment, you know, make sure that's what you say and then we'll give you about a minute for comment because we are going to have additional people joining us. I'd like to welcome people from all over New Mexico and a friend of mine from South Sudan in Africa. So hello to all of you and thank you for being here today. We are going to be talking about something that I think is kind of difficult at this point. But before we do, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I became an entrepreneur starting up companies and didn't realize that that's what I was doing because I was basically doing it for other people. I, the, one of the biggest was worth about $1.5 billion. There were six of us that built, uh, operationalized, and created the culture for the University of California San Diego Health System in San Diego, California. It's the La Jolla campus. Uh, we didn't realize at the time that we, would be, we were startup entrepreneurs, but in fact, we were the ones creating the mission, the vision, what our customers were like, going out and doing customer discovery, creating products, figuring out what they were going to cost, how we were gonna make revenues. Because in a university hospital, that's very difficult to do because the cost per discharge day is very high. When I realized what I was doing, in about 2000, I said, hmm, I think I'd like to do this as an individual consultant. First company I worked with was a company called Learning Framework. It was established by two gentlemen who started up something you and I use every day. How many of you use YouTube or look at news stories or have an Apple iPad and have Apple iPad news show up things from all kinds of news sources and you sit there and watch the videos. Well, Brian Kenner and Harry Gruber own all the international patents on video streaming via the World Wide Web. They got the patents in 1997 and in 2000 sold their company for $3.5 billion. When I realized what it was I had myself involved with, I said, okay, this is what I want to do. But it wasn't about the money. Basically, a friend of mine, Guy Kawasaki, he's one of the founders of Apple, said the following. He said, if your goal is money, you won't make money. If your goal is making a difference in the lives of other people, it stands to reason. You'll be passionate. You'll work hard. You'll stick with it. You'll listen to advice. You'll get a mentor. You'll form a good group of people to work with, and you will succeed. And so we're going to riff off of that the whole way through. How do we design, create, or renovate our current business model? Now, the renovate part is very interesting to me and very important to me because we have gone for the last six months through an environment in which it's very, been very bit difficult to open up companies and or to keep companies running. When, and also, at the same time, we've had a tremendous number of startups. So we're going to kind of go through the logic and reasoning behind something that I find very important, and that is companies that succeed are deliberately designed. That doesn't mean people don't get together and brainstorm. We all do. It doesn't mean we don't make mistakes. We all do. But it means that we sat down and had some important questions that we wanted to answer. And most of the time, it's not about the technology. It's not about the food. It's not about the clothing. It's not about any of the services we plan on providing. 
it's about those things that have to do with what kind of ingenious business model are we going to have to make money. And we're going to talk about some ingenious brand new business models today. One of the things you'll notice as I do the presentation is that I put a lot of links on this. Now, Cecilia is going to make sure this gets up, up on the uh, UNM Rainforest Innovations website. So you will be able to see it again, and you'll be able to get the information about the websites. But you'll notice I put them in either bright red or big blue letters and copy those, those website URLs down because they're going to take you to some information that I will think you need. So again, Susan Rosenbaum Cornelius, I'm a founder of seven different companies. I've coached more than almost at this point 500 and have been significantly involved in 77 companies. Most of those have been tech companies, but some of them have been quite a bit different. So let, let's get talking. Um, oh, my, my memoji is off to the side. Well, hello, everybody. Most people don't realize, and in the United States right now, and I think COVID has helped people begin to realize this, there are more than 27 million corporations in the United States. Only 2,500 of those have more than 500 employees. In other words, a whopping 99% of all businesses in the United States are small businesses. And frankly, when we look at the history of our country, amongst all the things that drive us crazy, we don't always recognize that this is a country founded on the backs of small businesses. Nearly half our nation's workforce, close to 50%, are working for small businesses. That's 120 million people of working age working in small businesses. And in any given year, small businesses account for 60 to 65% net new jobs. All of this comes from the United States Com Chamber of Commerce, okay? I didn't make these statistics up. So there are possibilities out there probabilities that we can start up small businesses right now, but just how do we do it? When we talk about startups, at least in the world that I've lived in for the last hmm, 20 years, I've either been working with tech or med tech startups or small businesses. I've also worked with a group of nonprofits and a group of family owned businesses to try to get things turned around. We're gonna talk about one of these, those today. It's a company called Ale Republic. It's located up in Cedar, uh, Crest, and one of his entrepreneurs is a gentleman that went through one of our programs by the name of P Patrick Johnson. First, let's understand that 66% of the businesses that are small businesses in New Mexico or anywhere else outsource to small businesses. I want you to keep that in your head because one of the customer areas you have when you're starting up a tech company or let's say a pizza company or you're trying to renovate your family business is that other businesses may be able to use your service. They're one of your customers. Now let's think about how we involve them in changing how you provide what it is you make money on. The next thing I wanna talk about is something called venture firms. For those of you not familiar with the term, people like myself, we don't speak English. What's a venture firm? A venture firm is a company that makes a decision to invest in a company they claim stock and ownership and ability to influence outcomes. They do tremendous deal, due diligence on whether or not that company is going to uh, proceed and be successful. I will tell you right now that whether they're an angel like me or a venture company, an angel's another style of investing, what they do is we look at the entrepreneur. We're looking at you. You are almost 99% of what we make the decision based on. And I know that sounds crazy because what you're doing is putting together what, something that you believe is innovative. So venture firms then are looking for investments that start at about 250K. And they are looking for 30 to 40% of the company. They don't like to stay in an investment very long. They wanna get paid off in a very short period of time. And those of you that have watched Shark Tank on television have gotten a good taste of what they're like. And all of that is those things we use daily in our life. So I'm not just talking about tech firms when I talk about that. Bottom line, the number one reason that startups fail is they misread their market. And we're gonna talk about how you read your market when you're dealing with things virtually like we are doing right now. Down the bottom, you'll see the website for embroker.com. Lots of startup statistics there if that's what you wanna look at. There's some myths that surround what we do for a living. Now off here on the right, uh, hopefully you can see that. 
there's something called a business model canvas and there's a cup of coffee. That is sitting in on a table in Ale Republic up in Cedarcrest. We're gonna talk about what tools we can use with family, friends, whoever is involved in our businesses, along with our tech teams, to talk about where do we go with this technology. It's not enough just to build it. That, that's what I call the field of dreams. Build it and they will come. Well, Apple was able to do that, but believe it or not, they did a lot of breathtaking brainstorming in the background, figuring out what they were gonna do with it. And everybody always has in their mind, how do we become Facebook? How do we become Apple? Well, maybe you're going to build something that somebody else is gonna take over, and then you're gonna use the money to do your real passion and make a difference in that way. So keep that thing about, I'm in this to make a difference, and I wanna do it excellent, outstanding, beyond anyone's expectations, because that's how I'm gonna make money. And is it hard work? Working on some, a technical product at the same time you're commercializing, working on expanding your family business at the same time you're commercializing, trying to find the money is something that keeps you up 24 and seven. I've done it for 20 years and I really enjoy doing it because there are things that could help us become successful. So one of the myths is that big breakthroughs require big resources. That's not true. The famous examples that everybody likes to use, Google, Facebook, and YouTube, um, they started very small, but they were smart. They took an idea that they knew everybody else was not doing, and then they took a lot of courage, and they just said, I'm gonna do this. And courage is one of the premier things we look for when we're looking at something to invest in. We need to know that every single solitary member of the team has the courage to launch a company. There's another myth about it takes a ton of people to launch a company. No, it doesn't. Uh, one of the first companies that I launched that was my own was five people. There was my business partner who was an incredible physicist who was creating devices that gave sig off signal in very unusual ways and signal turns things on and off and we're using it more and more and more. Those of you that watched the launch of SpaceX, um, a rocket to the space station, everything in there was signals. There was no, there actually was no uh, uh, control system board in front of them like you find in big airplanes. It was simply a computer. And a lot of the stuff that got turned on was by red lights that sat in the pilot's helmets. Successful startups are mentor driven with mentors who are focused on your success. Now I'm not talking about hiring somebody like me. I'm actually talking, it could be a family member, it could be your priest, it could be a community member, it could be somebody from the EDA or another person or tech guru of some sort that is taking you on because they believe in you. It could even be a hired consultant or member. But finding somebody that you're willing to listen to so once you, once you get that thing worked up inside you and you don't know what to do about it, or you're going off in another direction and other team members are saying to you, don't do it, it's a good idea to have somebody that can kind of ground you. In terms of designing and renovating business models, it's done by your startup team. We're gonna talk about how to do that today. You're gonna to gather them together right early to brainstorm what goes on. And it's finding the time to do that at the same time you're developing your prototypes if, you're, if those prototypes are menus, at the same time you're developing those and following a specific strategy to design and create and renovate your business model. So your go goal then is to change the world one dinner at a time, one device at a time, one new offering at a time. It's not to study it. I always tell people if you're spending a lot of time at the computer doing research, you're avoiding getting started, just get going. My goal is to try to give you some tools and some ideas to make this path to entrepreneurship clearer to you. It really does have a formula behind it. It is not what you would learn in business school working on your master's or PhD. I'm not putting that down. This is what a whole group of us across this country in the lean entrepreneurship movement have discovered really works. And we look for these things in the companies that we work with. So we're gonna talk about how you map out a company to create value for your customers. Let's say that again. We're talking about how you map out value for your customers. The number of times I have watched people create a, a company, not map out the value, what they think it is, and then go out there and test it and ask customers, that's the number of times I've seen companies fail. 
we're going to talk about an interesting company. It's called Stamps.com. This was fascinating for me because when it showed up you know, somewhere around 1996, 98, it was fascinating to me that I didn't have to go to the post office anymore. Now, like a lot of Americans, I depend on the, the post office for certain things, uh, FedEx for others, UPS for others, DHL for others. But stamps.com was impressive. You could buy sticky paper, you know, in a package with several sheets. You could pin, print out your own shipping labels and your own postage. And darn, then you could go put it on the package and take it to the post office and mail it. What ended up happening is that the, the first round of money that they raised to do this, actually there were four graduate students from a California university that put it to get the idea together. And their first investment was about 1.5 million. The last investment that they put together was $35 million. And part, one of the investors was the United States Post Office. And we all have probably heard what's going on with the United States Post Office right now. Um, I sincerely uh, hope that they're able to survive uh, a lot of the pressure on them uh, to figure out how to stay alive monetarily. But a couple of months ago, if not a year ago, Stamps.com announced they were going to no longer part with the United States Postal Office. As a result, their stock, stock dropped 50% in value. So what about the customer's needs were they not listening to? What didn't they know? I could do those labels. I could do the stamps, put it on the package myself. They even gave me a free scale. What, wasn't, what weren't they listening to? If you've got any ideas, throw that up on chat and we'll, we'll talk about them as we go along. What they weren't listening to is that Americans as a whole, regardless of race, sex, ethnicity, or, or, or any of the other things that bring us together, had a feeling and emotion about the United States Postal Office and we didn't want to see it fail. They didn't talk to the customers and say, if we divorce ourselves from the US Postal Service, what are you going to do? They lost some 50% of their customers. Okay, when you design a business, you're going to see a, this bright yellow because I really wanted to get your attention. And hopefully I've got it. And hopefully you're going to write this down. This is something called a business model canvas. If you're taking notes, please write down business model canvas. Those of you that have worked with me before have already seen this. Um, this is just parts of it. And I'm going to get to the business model canvas next. But here's the parts that I think all of us as entrepreneurs agree are the important parts that we need to get from a, uh, from a young startup company, okay? First of all, at the center is the customer and answering the question, how are you going to make a difference? It's the customer and how are you going to make a difference? There's a company we're gonna be talking about where they decided the customer was unemployed Americans over the last six to seven months. And they decided they were gonna make a difference by getting them jobs. How they did it was very different and they're very successful. And they started first in the United Kingdom and then they came to the United States of America. We'll talk about it because they focused on the person who would use their services and then how that would make a difference in those people's lives and get them to jobs. Okay, we're talking about people who are unemployed because they lost their jobs due to the shutdowns across the world. Another piece of the success strategy is the value of your idea. So if you look to the left there, there's the idea. We've all got ideas. I mean, I can't even begin to tell you the number of ideas that buzz through my mind that I've gotten to work with. But the value proposition of that idea, what if we built a one and a half billion dollar hospital system and everybody had a private room and everybody had wooden floors and everybody had a place for a family member to spend the night with their own TV set what if there was a computer or a live board in the room that people could touch to get information about test results? What if the caregivers could sit outside the room and through giant windows look in to see how you were doing without disturbing you? What if you could say, this is what I want to do today in terms of my health care, and what if instead of having to call a nurse's aide to give you a bedpan, when the pharmacist walked in, you asked the pharmacist, she gave you a bedpan. And she helped you. Well, this hospital system was one of 35, and one of the one I told you that I was part of startup team for. But we had to say to people, what is this value? 
to those people that were in leadership, the value was we're a university-based hospital. We have to reduce our costs on a daily basis because we got to continue to serve the population who can't afford health care. And we're bringing them into this beautiful environment. That we think if we involve them in their health care and respect them as individuals and bring services to them instead of constantly dragging them out of their room to other services, that they're going to heal faster and, in, and they won't get readmitted. And in fact, we've proved that in the space of nine months. So our value proposition was to the customer, you're going to get healthier in a shorter period of time and you won't have to return for care. Our value proposition to those who invest in us, it's going to cost less. We're going to have less turnover in staff. And our value proposition to physicians was if you have, if you're in this for business, you're in this for curing and helping others, by, by doing what we're doing, you're going to have a better informed patient to work with, regardless of education, language, or background. Because we spoke 85 different languages at that hospital system. Going back to how we were going to be, make a difference, patient-focused care delivered at the bedside by teams who were capable of making the decisions with the patient for their own health care. Storyboard. What's a storyboard? Those of you that watched the beautiful movie with Chadwick Boseman, The Black Panther, know that the artists who created that movie created massive drawings showing what was in each scene of the movie so that the director could use that to inform the actors and work on the digital art that filled in the background. That's a storyboard. For a business, it's generally about three equivalent, they're equivalent to slides. Three slides where in the first slide you show overall what it is that you're doing. In the second slide, you show how you deliver it to the customer. And the third slide, you show what the benefit is to the people who use it and the people who invest in your company. It's called a storyboard. And it helps you create something called your business model canvas, BMC, which we're going to look at. I like the storyboard component of this because it means you sit down with stickies on your computer and the business model campaign canvas on your computer or actual printed out paper, and you get to work brainstorming every idea you've got about how you can do it. And you bring in people who don't even know anything about your business to discuss it. We do that at UNM. We call them hackathons. We do them in healthcare and we do them with technical products. And not everybody on the team knows the product. We bring in volunteers who love doing this kind of brainstorming. Sometimes we work together as long as four days to figure out what the storyboard is going to telling us and how we're going to do it. And we create the business model canvas. We actually create a presentation we can give to investors. Okay, so let's go to the next thing. A business model canvas is just a simple tool. It's got components of what goes into your business model. Now, creating a business model is not going to create stuff. It's how you're going to act upon it, how you're going to execute upon it that's really important. But it focuses, again, on some things that I'm just going to keep on repeating. You're building something for your customer. And you're trying to say, my customer's going to love this. This is a different kind of chili relleno with a different kind of cheese. And it's got pomegranates and all kinds of green chili on it, along with pinones. And I really think they're going to love it. But how do you know? Who's tasted it? What does it cost? Are you preparing it to be delivered at curbside? What quality is it going to have when it gets home? Okay. That's something we call the value proposition. What value is it to be able to come to your place and pick it up? And I'm going to talk about how a lot of the restaurants here in New Mexico have been creating value for the customers that are coming curbside and picking up foods. Although this weekend they get to be open for, with 50% occupancy for the first time. The value proposition, when you are looking for investment, are the most important words you say. It differs from a pitch, and we have all kinds of pitch contests at UNM where you get to pitch your idea and there's money available as prizes, sometimes ranging as high as $5,000, sometimes as little as $500, but the whole idea is to get exposure to your idea. The value chain, this is value to my investors, this is a value to my company, and if your investors are families, it's value to your family, value to your company and the members of the company, but the biggest thing, the value to the customer. And how does anything the customer do, do, how does anything you do, how does anything your investors do impact that value chain that goes into your storyboard? The profit mechanism. We're going to talk about patterns for making profit because companies and people are making money 
off of very strange things right now. You know, 10 years ago, if you would have said to me, Susan, and that's me, your grandson, Justino Jaime, is going to be an influencer. He's going to be a member of the Navarro cheer team, which was on Netflix. And in case you didn't see that TV show, it's been nominated for six Emmy Awards. And he's going to be on Ellen, and he's going to be called an influencer. And he's going to be an influencer for Procter & Gamble, Neutrogena, uh, Bono Clothing, or Bono Clothing, uh, and, and so on and so forth. I would have said, uh, I don't even know what you're talking about. But there was a profit mechanism that comes into the communications that he does and how he gets paid and working with an agent and all of that. And he's actually an influencer. That's true of just about anyone who's forming a company. There has to be a pattern that you're going to follow that you may in fact pivot on. And we'll talk about what pivot means because again, I said I don't speak English and create a business model for what it is that you want to do. So um, I can't use my finger on my screen. Right now, business as usual no longer exists, but I don't find that defeating. Uh, I personally worked with three companies that launched over the last six months and I know others were doing the same thing. So we actually worked with a lot of companies to pitch and get funding for brand new ideas. We also helped other companies keep their doors open. And it was very exciting. Did I like what was going on in the economy and with our people? No, but what we were able to achieve was very exciting. We weren't the only ones doing it. There were groups of people all over the United States and 50 states working to do the same exact thing. But, you know, when I think about it, if I would have said, yeah, I'm going to be doing most of my business on either Zoom or Google Meeting or Microsoft Team, I would have said, hmm, that's interesting because I was already doing it, all right? But most people would have said, no, I'm not going to conduct my meeting and talk to my customers over the virtual world. And who would have thought, like I said, being an influencer or using TikTok would have been a way to have a business model. Now, are we getting some comments up there? I don't know. Can't tell. Um, so if you looked, oh, goodness, I went ahead to, I'm um, going the wrong direction. Um, I've got a problem, a navigation problem right now. Yikes, I'm going backwards. Well, it's like technical problem in fact, fact on behalf of the user, somehow or another, I pressed something that took me ahead. I'm gonna go back to where I was. This is, I got a problem guys, hang on. And I'm gonna go back in and put it back up. Uh, Cecilia, I got a problem with my navigation. Can you try sharing your screen again? Yeah, I will. Okay, let's see how we do, guys. Apologize for that. So here's one of the companies that I find really, really unusual. Can you all hear me? Yeah, but we can't see your screen right okay. now. Okay. Um, let's, let's go with share screen again. And... Um, I'm not seeing my, um, I'm, the problem is I'm not seeing my uh, presentation. Um, bear with me, everybody. I've got um, a technical problem. I don't know whether I've lost connectivity or what the problem is. Um, 
I'm gonna get out of this again and go share screen and see if I can't pick it up. There it is. There we go. It's okay. sharing. Now. Yeah. Sorry, I may have had a connectivity problem. Apologize for that. Okay, let's start right here. We lost a little bit of time, but that's all right. This is what we call a business model canvas. And this is what you're going to be, if you work with us at UNM and tech transfer or in any of our coaching sessions, this is what we're gonna be working on. We start first with um, the, the value proposition. What is the value of what it is I'm doing to the market? Um, and if you've got a product that has various different customer segments, that's over here, we're gonna ask you to write a value proposition for each one, okay? We also talk about customer relationships. How do we form customer relationships? We do something called customer discovery. And that is we go out to talk to people we don't know. We try to start with some we do know, but we go out and talk to people we don't know and ask the question, what do you think of the product we've got? What would you be willing to pay for it? How are you doing this now? What are you paying for it? Would you like us to keep you informed on what it is that we're doing? And we get information that validates there's a market for this product. Because like I said, build it and they will come does not work. So one of the things that we're doing is we're working on the technical improvement of our product, getting our beta prototype done, fighting for funding on that at the same time we're talking with customers. The equivalent of that would be if you're working at a university, that you would be working on your product inside the research lab, and then at the same time, you'd having, be having people come in to take a look at what you're doing. People worry about their IP all the time, and we'll talk about that just briefly. Um, having your IP protected, your, your intellectual property protected, or trademarking your product is very, very, very important. But it shouldn't prevent you if you're starting to use the words copyright, trademark, or patented on whatever it is you're doing on most ideas. Um, other times we are going to be like Coca-Cola and keep it as a trade secret and nobody's ever going to know. But what we're trying to say is what if I built this, would you use it? How would you use it? When would you use it? Where would you use it? And what would you do with it? We can do all the guessing about why this is the most important thing that's ever happened to the world. Imagine being Steve Jobs building the first uh, laptop computer that weighed close to 40 pounds. It was not a laptop. I had one. And then finding out from customers that they didn't like it because they had to put their operating disk in, that it was too heavy, that it was cute that it talked to us and we could play Pokemon, but we needed it to be able to do more things. And that's when in 1983, they came out with the next version. Also surprisingly at that time, Steve Jobs was asked to leave Apple and a whole new team took over. And then nine years later, they went, oh my God, we got to have them back. And then the rest is history. Okay, so we want to know what kinds of value proposition we want. What are we building for whom? What customer segments? What value do we deliver to these customers? Which one of our customer problems we are, how are we helping to solve? How we solve that problem, does that meet a need for the customer? And what bundles of products and services are we offering to each customer segment? What's it's really, really, yes, you can't see Not it again? Uh, no, I can see it. Not to interrupt, but someone has a question from sure. Brea Gallegos. Um, he's wondering, um, how will the pandemic affect people's business model approach? It stays the same. Um, those of you that think I'm being naive, I just got done saying to you, we've been launching companies during the, the pandemic all across the United States. We've, in fact, in the last quarter, launched more new companies than we ever have before. Is because people are being very purposeful. The thing that scares us the most is who's going to buy it. And we're going to get into how we reach those people that buy, that buy it in a couple more slides. Um, we're going to have to use different approaches. We're going to have to use a whole lot of social media to achieve our goals. Okay. So let's, let's move on to the, the, to the next slide. One of the things you need to do is you need to know what you're selling. This doesn't change if there's a pandemic. What's the problem we think we're solving? We still need to be talking about that. What does the com com customer think the problem is? We still need to be talking about that. I spend all day long on Zoom. We had a company that we launched last semester, which was a device you put out in the middle of a 
solar field. It takes a look at non-photovoltaic measurements. In other words, whenever the clouds come over, the whole solar field sh sh uh, shuts down. Can this device predict when that's going to happen quickly enough so that the power companies can either buy power for somewhere, uh, somewhere else, turn on their batteries, or go to another field to provide power to the grid? In states like California, that's been a tremendous, tremendous problem. What does a customer think the problem is? We started in, we sent out letters to over a hundred different companies that have solar fields. We discovered they were organized differently than we thought. We went out to the big companies like SDG&E in Southern California. And then we went out to consultants that work with these companies. We got three offers at the end of 10 weeks. What did we use? Zoom. What people have a tendency to do when they're working on Zoom is a lot of the barriers are broken down. Does it replace talking face-to-face -to, -face to people? There's varying opinions on that. All I can say to you is we took a highly patented product, took it out to the market, and they got three offers for it at the end of 10 weeks. So we knew what our product was. We knew how it worked. We knew what problem we could, it was alleviating for customers because we talked with over 100 people. We figured out who the service companies were who were interacting with it. And we also asked these big power companies, what does success look like for you if you use this? And we got three power companies willing to use it in their fields to deploy it and to help us further develop our, our beta product. And then they would also be on a licensing deal with us. So I, I'm, I'm just not one of these people. I think part of what it takes to do things in time of COVID is my attitude about, I don't get to do business like I used to. One of the things we did is we took this, the uh, innovator who was also the CEO, CEO of the company and we made him part of the product. We put him out there on everything from Instagram to Facebook. Yes, we used Facebook business and we, and we used Instagram and we used LinkedIn and we got him out there. More than half of the, the emails we sent out to try to position them in front of people, were to, we networked via LinkedIn. It was constant monitoring of that. We had other people on the team who helped us, only one other person actually, and myself, and we got the information out there. And so that when we sent things to people, we said, come look at the video we just did about how this thing works. And we did an animated storyboard, just using typical kinds of applications like Adobe that you've got at your fingertips. We put a an animated storyboard out there. They saw it and they called us. I'll talk about some more examples like that. Customer relationships. You've heard me say it over and over again. You can't proceed to market unless your customers know what you're offering. This is the beginning of your success. So we defined our value proposition for the device I just told you, which is it allows the customer in less than 10 minutes to predict that a solar field is going down and make the decision to either buy on the open market, use their battery fields, or switch to another grid. Because if they're down any more than 30 minute, th minutes, they get fined by the federal government. And so there's a big motivator because those fines are like a million bucks. And so they had a big motivator. We found out all of that and we said, can we set this up in your field? And, and instead it went further than that, we had offers. So. When we were talking with people on the phone, we talked to people we didn't know, and that's where the courage comes in. We had names of all kinds of people, and we just called them up. One of the students that I worked with was a student from UNM who comes from another country, and unfortunately right now can't travel outside the country. So he had to figure out how does he Zoom with, to get his 100 interviews to figure out whether or not his product is something that people want. And what it was, was a new way of doping fiber optic cables so that communications that we use around the world don't break down. Well, he had been to a lot of student conferences. He was doing a lot of reading and he was on LinkedIn. Everybody says LinkedIn doesn't work. He sent out 100 uh, messages on LinkedIn to the CEOs of these companies figuring they're million, billion dollar companies. They're not going to call me back. They did, 60 of them. And that is using Zoom. Okay, so what we did is we planned out the questions, we wrote them down, we asked to interview them. People said yes. Some people said yes when we called them on the phone, so we didn't really get to go to Zoom or Microsoft Team. We had to be ready to ask the questions right then and there. 
but we kept on going. We never said, okay, somebody said, all they said was no, they don't want to do an interview. Let's move on to the next one. Those of you that are really interested in uh, doing these kinds of interviews, we have boot camp also through UNM uh, for our university program on April 15th at 10 a.m. If you go to the website, and I'll show the, that website in just a little bit, you can uh, take a look how to sign up for that. Channels, now there's an interesting concept. How do you do business during COVID? What in the heck is a, a, is a channel? It's somebody who can introduce you to a customer segment. In the, guy, in the case of the guy with the photovoltaic device that takes a look at light saturation for a solar field, he, we had somebody that I knew that I used to work with um, as a consultant in, uh, through SDG&E in San Diego. We called him, he got us in touch with the entire field of small operators throughout the entire state of California, and that's how we got the offers. The question becomes, are you reaching potential customers right now? What are you using? Well, if you're using, used to picking up the phone and calling them, that's one way. But how are you using the web? How are you using uh, your mobile phone? How, how are you physically visiting them? And does that need to change? And in all likelihood, the physical visiting does need to change. It's changing, however, for all of us. We are using media more than we've ever done before. As a matter of fact, it's like 99% of what I do. Which ones work best? How will we be selling or distributing? Now that becomes really interesting. You are your brand. Now what do I mean by that? Well, you know what an influencer is. You are your brand. So if you start talking on YouTube and you do planned interventions, by the way, there's a great book out there called 100, it's called 1 Million Followers. You can get it on uh, Amazon. 1 Million Followers is the name of the book. It talks about how you draw up a calendar, you say, I'm going to tweet on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. This is the content. And then there are delivery platforms out there, which for a small charge will deliver those tweets for you so you don't have to remember. But you're getting it out there that, hi, I'm Susan Cornelius. I've got a new product. I'm looking for people who are willing to talk with me about how they would use it, would they use it, what are they using now, and what are they willing to pay for it you'll be helping me launch my company and be successful. And then they go to LinkedIn or they go to YouTube or they go somewhere else and they find a video about you and they see you. How do you do all of this? You just do it. You don't need an agent to do this, but you do need to have a plan for doing this. There's a great course out there called Create Cell Bank. It's taught, taught by Dr. Bill Zarletta. We're gonna give you the, uh, the connections to that at the end of the class. And it teaches you in the community how to reach out using various forms of social media. Which ones work best? I'm going to share that with you in just a minute. How will we be selling and distributing? Now, here's what's interesting. There are various models out there. Most people don't realize that Ford Motor Company sells cars. It, it puts together in the United States or elsewhere. Most of us know that they do actually one whole part of the construction of their vehicles, certain kinds of vehicles, like my Ford Explorer in Mexico. Then they bring it to the United States and they sell it through distributors. It's their design produced by a company in Mexico who does a very good job, I love my car. And then it gets sold in the United States with dealers with whom they have, uh, they have distribution agreements. So sometimes we come up with an idea, we do the prototype, then we license it out to other people who build it for us and then bring it back to somebody else to sell for us. Which ones are the most cost effective? Those of you that are saying Ford Motor Company had a lot of money behind it, you're absolutely right. But we're gonna talk about small, small companies are doing something similar in just a minute. And then how are we integrating the, what we're doing with our custom routines? We know, for instance, that most people use social media the most early in the morning, somewhere during a broad lunchtime and in the evenings. As a matter of fact, when I recruit, help small companies recruit their new members that are going to be working with them because we've done some fundraising and the money is now there, we do most of our telephone calling between 5 o'clock and 7 o'clock at night. And that is to talk with people who have applied for jobs with us. Same thing with putting out Instagram, Facebook posts, LinkedIn posts, Instagram posts, all that stuff. You do it when your customer is available. If you want to learn more, by the way, about patterns of how companies' business models are put together. There's a link down there 
It's called businessmodelnavigator.com. It's an excellent website. We're going to talk about some of the things that they do. Your product, again, here she goes again, exists for the customer. For whom are you creating value? You're going to at first hypothesize who that is, but then it, before anybody will invest in you, they're going to say, how do you know? How many customers did you talk to? Now, those of you that know about the National Science Foundation, you know that they have this program called i -Corps. I'm the lead mentor for it on campus at UNM, but we also, there's regional programs for it. And there are other kinds of federal programs that do exactly this, where they coach you and give you the money, get, you, get your company started. Go out there, take a look at what the most popular uh, sites are, and when they make their announcements as to what they're doing, it's how I started up my first company with particle accelerator technology. Who are our most important customers? What do they need? I don't care if it's your grandpa's restaurant. You sit down and say, who are our most important customers? And you talk to them via Zoom, or you talk to them when they come in to buy product and get some ideas about what they like so that you can position yourself showing your food on Facebook, on Instagram. You're starting to get what I'm talking about, okay? But the thing I wanna hear from you is how do you know how do you know that people are going to buy that product? What kind of relationship do each one of our customers want to have with us? So in the case of the people with the solar fields, they want to talk, talk to us all the time if they're having any problems, only if they're having problems. For the most part, they found the device really easy to use. They didn't think they needed to establish a relationship and they could monitor their own data analytics themselves. Which ones have we established? Well, who do we already have as people who are interested in what we're doing? Family members, friends are going to tell us it's a brilliant idea. Are they going to be willing to bring people in to a Zoom meeting with 30 different people where we ask them what they think of our product? I would say they would. You need to ask them. How do they want to be integrated in the rest of our business model? This is really very simple. How do they want to be kept informed and are they interested in becoming partners? How costly would they be if they were a partner helping us sell a seller product? Here's some interesting ways you were talking about how do we reach customers during COVID. I did some research to make sure my statistics were up to date as of today. So MAUs means monthly active users. Facebook, 2.23 billion. Most people think oh, it's only old people that are using it. There's a business arm to Facebook and they're putting products out. That's how come when you, when all your devices are integrated and maybe you looked at a really cool pair of shoes and all of a sudden shoe advertisements start showing up on your feed in, in, in Facebook. YouTube, a tremendous boon. Uh, one of the young entrepreneurs that I was working with who I told you was from Iran came up with an idea for a ventilator that could be built simply out of materials you find in a, in a hardware store. That particular device only cost 50 bucks to make and, but he needed about $500 to do some testing on it. And he came to me, he talked with me, he called up a colleague of mine up in Boulder, Colorado from the factory who does uh, funding, a big funding of companies, the VC. So he's looking at things that are gonna take 250,000. But he said, you know what, Mustafa, I'm gonna take 500 bucks out of my pocket. You come back and tell me what you did. Mustafa using animated videos launched it and it's being used in third world countries all over the world. His design for a ventilator that is made for those countries that are ventilator poor for their COVID patients. WhatsApp, if you've never seen it before, never used it before, it actually started off as a way of communications. It's now being used for sales. And then Instagram, another one that started out as a way of, of uh, communicating. Now, a friend of mine said to me just today, why would anybody use Instagram to sell products? All it is is a photograph. You can't even explain it. That's the problem. The photograph's got to show somebody using it, okay? The rest of the stuff that's on here, I'm going to point out PayPal. We're going to talk about PayPal in the next slide. PayPal, why? Um, I would ask all of you, if you're not already signed up, get signed up on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and PayPal. That's PayPal only if you're going to start launching, only if you've got some products to sell. Um, PayPal is actually the biggest bank in the world. It does. Oh, it has over 300 million customers and does over... Uh, has over 20 million different merchant accounts and does billions of transactions every year. There are other companies out there, Apple Pay, Skrill, Payza, Google Wallet, Stripe. We've paid two checked out, authorized.net, and even Intuit's got some products. 
that are in competition, but they're not even close, okay? And you can invoice through PayPal business people and they can pay you and the money goes straight from one to the other, okay? Um, this is another way in which you cope with what's going on. How do we reach customers through our websites? Now, this is always a tough one. Uh, when you're starting up a brand new company, what do you put on your website? I've worked with young entrepreneurs, old entrepreneurs, middle of the road entrepreneurs, and they've been able to get their websites up in less than 30 days. First thing I ask everybody to do, and Bill Sarletta, if you take Create Cell Bank, is gonna ask you to do the same thing. Go out and register some domain names. It doesn't cost that much. One of the ones that's handy to use is GoDaddy. There are other sites that are out there. Don't start exploring all over the web unless you use DuckDuckGo. And most of you should know what DuckDuckGo.com is. I don't use Google anymore. It tracks me. I use DuckDuckGo. And DuckDuckGo, I can go anywhere I want, and they're not keeping track of me, okay? I look for other things that are out there. But GoDaddy, go put URLs in there. I, when I first started in business, I protected my name, my full name, my short name, my ideas for various companies that I was working on. And here I am a bazillion years later, and I've still got those names and I'm still using them. My email is at, um, uh, at ssolutions.cc. Now, what in the heck is .cc? I've always been an early adopter of technology. And in 1992, when the web showed up, um, .cc was CompuServe. We were all tech companies. And what it means to the rest of the big tech companies in the world is I've been around for a while and they can trust that I've got some kind of longevity. And I would think from 1992 to 2020, yeah. I've got some longevity. Um, there are website builders that you can look at. My favorite is Wix, okay? Most everybody I know is using Wix. WordPress, uh, a lot of other people use it. I don't like that little tiny HTML screen I've got to operate in, Weebly. HostGator, Squarespace, Duda, and Wix, are those are the top ones that people use. It does cost a little bit of money, but it's worth it. Um, there's a, a, a PC mag, um, URL down there that connects you to the best web website builders. So during COVID, do you hear me saying anything different than you know you need to do? You're hearing me say that you're going to have to be doing a lot of work on Zoom, uh, Google Meeting, and, uh, and uh, Microsoft Team, and you're going to need subscriptions to them because uh, most of them will do up to three people free, and then over that, and that's for 45 minutes, and then over that you have to you're gonna do a large uh, team hackathon to develop your product with all the people who are working in your company, but you can't meet face-to-face -face because they're all over the country, which my companies have always had talent working on them all over the country. So you, we used to use something called GoToMeeting. It was terrible. So that's why we use these other things right now because we can share documents when I don't press the wrong buttons. So Wix hosts a Gator, Duda, Squarespace, and you're saying, I don't wanna put my product out there. What about a website that talks about you and your team and that you're coming up with exciting ideas? Maybe it's only got four pages with the other pages reserved. But we need for people to see you. It's what athletes do. It's what influencers do. It's how they get people's attention. Revenue streams. What are our uh, customers really willing to pay for? Um, there's words out there, and again, I tell you, we don't speak English. Licensing, freemium, uh, fees, um, they're all over here on the right-hand side, and you can't see them because all the names are in the way. Our box, my box is in the way. Can you see them? They're customer lists, great people, marketing, sales, managing servers. There's all kinds of ways to buy lists. Um, I don't buy lists. I go to people and I ask them questions. I ask everybody I know, this is what I'm trying to do, who do you know? People are extremely willing to share information. It's how I start off. 1992, I'm working for UCSD Healthcare. I go to those people that I know are working at the bench inside Pfizer and all kinds of pharmaceutical companies. We're all at the same level, we're all beginners. And I say to them, who should I be talking to? They tell me, I talk to those people. Those of you are saying, well, I can't talk like you can. Uh, when I was 31 years old, I never talked to anybody I didn't know, I was a geek particle accelerator physicist, what was I gonna do? I wasn't talking to people I didn't know. But they helped me through warm introductions to other people. Who are gonna be our key partners? Who are gonna be our key suppliers? Which key resources are requiring from uh, uh, partners? Which key activities do we need to perform? So you've seen this picture, value proposition, 
Let's predict our, our market segments. Well, let's figure out what kind of customer relationships we have. Go out and talk to them and ask them questions about what value does my idea have to you. You don't need to do a technical uh, um, demonstration of your product, nor do you have to have anything other than a video. As a matter of fact, I would recommend you not show them your magic sauce. And then you say to them, who do you work with? And they tell you, do you think they should be a key partner for my company? Well, yeah, I'll introduce you. Who are your key suppliers? Oh, you work with so-and-so vacuum? Oh, yeah, can you introduce me to your sales rep? Oh, this is what we're doing. Oh, can I get a discount? What key resources are we acquiring from partners? People who may in the beginning not even ask for a cent to work with you because they love your idea. Which key activities do the, par perform the partners perform? Now we're talking the Ford model where they're doing the designs of the cars, certain models are being uh, produced and put together in other companies, and then they're distributed through distributors. They never see them at the Ford plant. They never, Ford plant never saw my Explorer. It was built in another country and then went to a, 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 um, a lot where I bought it, okay? What is difficult to come upon, but you have to have it together to get an investor, is just, oh, and I've got three minutes left, is just um, what your plan is by a certain date. I'm going to identify the platforms and social networks that I need in order to get out there to people. I'm going to identify how and who is working on increasing and keeping customers while we're innovating. And I'm going to create a problem solving team to develop my, my, my product. I'm going to identify what we need to get our first prototype. And I'm going to decide on who's going to do the fabrication and manufacturing for, for us. These are timelines, and they can go in phase one, phase two, phase three. Sometimes we have to make a decision that this is the product we can get out now, put in front of customers, and figure out how they use it. Key partners, some of them can be suppliers. Some of them can be people who do this kind of work already. Some of them may want to invest in our, co our company. Then you have to figure out what's in it for these partners, though, how they can save money, how they can reduce risk, and how you're gonna save them the cost of acquiring resources because you've got a better plan for them. Key partners can be all kinds of companies. Belmont, which is a big French designer, is working with H&M in the United States, producing clothing that all of us can afford that has a higher level design to it. Spotify and, Spar and Starbucks are hooked up to one another. Spotify is selling a lot of music for music companies that way. Ikea and DreamWorks have a new product right now called Latjo. It's a product for children and they're gonna be producing animated movies. That's what was in it for DreamWorks. The cost of doing your business, this goes without saying, this is where you start getting into the details of what people are willing to pay. And you've got to ask those questions. What would you be willing to pay for this new solar device for your wheelchair that was gonna power it? What are you currently paying? How are you currently doing it? We've taught you a new model and a new language. The business model canvas is a practical tool. Uh, if you were to sit out, my friends at Ale Republic, what they did is they sat down and they started working all this stuff on their business model canvas. And what ended up happening is customers kind of sat down next to them and started filling it in. When COVID came, they started doing it. He started posting, hey, I'm live now on Facebook. Come join me, give me some ideas. And they did. There's some great books out there that I'd like to turn you on to. One is by Alexander Osterwalder. He wrote the business model generation plan. Uh, it's got some stuff in it that I think kind of, it's kind of hard to dig through, but it tells you how to go about filling out your business model canvas. Now, I'm not just asking you to fill out a piece of paper. You've got to actively interact with customers, with suppliers, with people who have ideas similar to yours and ask them how they're doing what they're doing so you can figure out your market to launch your product. The Art of the Start is a conversation with Guy Kawasaki, one of the five founders of Apple. He's hysterical. Uh, if you look him up, he has a podcast that he does. He talks about characteristics of people who um, succeed. But in Art of the Start, he says, don't worry about whether your prototype is done, although I want you to get it done. Go out and start talking to people about what you're doing and find out if they even want it. What if you build it and they don't buy it? Lean Entrepreneur by Grant Cooper. He's part of the Lean Entrepreneur movement. He's really fantastic. And he has a whole thing in there about marketing to customers and doing customer interviews. We have other resources available from UNM. 
Uh, we are going to be, uh, and you can look it up at innovations.unm.edu slash events. Uh, we have another workshop about how to do customer discovery on October 14th from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. We have boot camps, which are 30 minute segments. They're not as long as this one on September 16th and October 21st. You can sign up for a 25 minute session with me. Um, the boot camps start at 10 a.m. on both those dates. The mentoring sessions, you'll sign up through Cecilia and she's gonna put announcements up on the event site where you can register for one of the times that is available. I'll spend 25 minutes with you. I'd like you to have started working on your business model canvas and to be thinking, have gone to Business Navigator and looked at ways of making money. I can't, you know, that would be a whole separate workshop, but click on businessnavigator.com and go there and take a look at the different ways of delivering what it, what it is you're trying to do. And I'll talk with you for about 25 minutes. There's two of those, one on September 16th. That's not that far away. Another on October 21st. And then we got Create, Sell, Bank with Bill Sarletta. This is an incredible series of programs. There are four different classes in there, one for the community. Depends on what your needs are. Um, if for students, um, you have direct access to these things. You do get credit for them, but you actually have to start up a business working with them. And then on Fridays, we have virtual rainforest hours for both students and community. Look those up. There's all kinds of mentors. You do it online with Zoom and you can bring your product there. So you can get um, free of charge mentoring with me on these dates. And then there are other mentors from our various programs that are gonna be doing it on Friday. So look up those hours. I wanna thank you for joining us. And um, I don't know if anybody wants to stay and ask some questions. <laughs>